These are the brand new starter decks for the Lord of the Rings LCG. Uh, these contain a single deck in each of four factions. You've got Sylvan Elves, Dwarves, Gondor, and Rohan. Now a deck in this game is usually 50 cards, but these packs contain 82 cards each, which is great because the extra cards you can use to tweak the deck uh, to get a little experimenting with some deck building, or you can use those extra cards in some other decks in the rest of your card pool. Um, so I am an experienced player of this game. At one point I owned a complete collection and have played every standard quest. So as I unbox these, I'm going to give some commentary about the cards inside so you can get an idea if you're a newer player, you know, how good these cards actually are. And spoiler alert, they're really good cards in these packs. Um, but you, know, you can click the timestamps at the bottom if you want to skip to a deck you're interested in. But at the end of the video, I'm also going to give some commentary about who I think these products are for, who should buy them them and maybe give a little ranking about which ones I think you should get first if you're only going to get one or two of them. So without further ado, let's get started with the Elves. All right, well let's open up the Elves of Lorien deck. These are the Sylvan Elves. Uh, there is another elf faction in the game, the Noldor Elves, which are very different. The Sylvan Elves are all about playing allies that have an enters play effect. So the turn you play them, they have some cool effect that they do. And then the Celeborn hero will boost all of that ally's stats on the turn they enter play. And then you want to play a card that's going to retreat them back into your hand so that you can play them again for the enters play effect a second time and a third time and a fourth time. So they're all about kind of bouncing in and out of play. Thematically, sort of like the elves are jumping out of the trees and then jumping uh, back into the tre into the trees again. So these are some of your key cards. It's going to give you a great overview in this pamphlet of how the deck works, what you should be looking for. It's a very fun deck to play. It's one of my favorite archetypes in the game. Uh, here's the deck list. This has been spoiled on ringsdb.com already, so you can look at them all there. But let me open the decks. So I'll go through one card at a time. All right, well, the first is Celeborn. You rarely find a Sylvan deck without him because uh, he boosts all Sylvan allies the turn they enter play. It gives him, you know, it gives all the allies plus one to all their stats. Incredibly strong hero. Um, you won't play him outside of a Sylvan deck though. Galadriel is another one of the Sylvan enablers, but she is actually a Noldor elf, doesn't really matter, but she can be played in so many different decks. She is one of my favorite heroes in the entire game. Uh, plays very differently than most heroes. Um, she's got full willpower for questing, but her ability says Galadriel cannot quest, attack, or defend, so she can't do anything a standard hero does. Um, allies you control do not exhaust to commit to the quest during the round they enter play. Uh, that's another really strong effect because you're going to be playing allies again and again, so they will quest for free, essentially, as long as Galadriel's on the table. Um, but then she has an action that will let you choose a player. That player reduces their threat by one and draws one card. Um, this is bonkers good. So instead of doing the standard questing fair, she will let you draw an extra card every turn and reduce your threat every single turn. So uh, there are some key attachments we'll see as well that kind of let her use this for willpower. Um, but she's an incredibly strong hero and can be splashed into lots of different spirit decks. Um, excellent, excellent hero. Haldir is just a lot of fun. Um, he is a ranged character and he has a combat action that if you don't engage any enemies, he can snipe an enemy that you're not engaged with. So he can aim for the staging area or a, an enemy engaged with some other player. Really, really fun. As long as you can avoid enemies, then you can do a lot with him. And it's uh, really, really good. So Defender of the Nath. Now we just get into all the standard allies. This is one of my least favorite Sylvan allies. It's sort of meant to be the Defender. It's just, it's really hard to trigger that ability. Um, it's okay, and it's neutral, so it's easier to play uh, for different resources, but I'm not a huge fan of this card. This is one of the key cards. You can use this outside of a Sylvan deck if there's a key event that you're searching for, but every time you play her, she searches the top five cards of your deck for an event card. Very good general use card, but great in a Sylvan deck because Sylvans need their events to work. This is an excellent two cost, two willpower spirit ally. You can play this in any spirit deck and be good to go. She reduces your threat by one every time you play her. Really good. She's even got one defense. She can soak up something on the turn she enters play. And every one of these starter decks comes with two, uh, 
uh, two or three copies of Gandalf. He's from the core set. This is a great ally. Um, some niche use, because when he enters play, he readies a hero. There's not many heroes that would need to be ready during the planning phase. Galadriel is one of them, though. So you can use Galadriel's ability in the planning phase, play him, and then ready Galadriel. Uh, really good, but the other great hero to use this ally with is Barovor from the core set. So if you have the core set, this is a great ally to splash in, so you can get that card draw and still use Barovor's ability. This is also a great card from the core set. Great to have extra copies. This is from the first cycle. Uh, this guy can attack enemies ignoring their defense if he attacks alone. Pretty strong in lots of situations for especially weaker enemies or really strong hill trolls that you kind of just want to ping away at. If you can't get through their defenses, this guy can cut through defense. Pretty cool. General use card. You don't need to use them in a Sylvan deck. This is another uh, great card. I like it. Um, when she enters play, the, uh, you choose a hero and they don't exhaust to quest. So it's sort of an action advantage card ally. You can play this in any generic deck. I, I have and uh, found it quite useful, but especially good in a Sylvan deck. All right, this guy can fetch Sylvan allies from your discard pile. Not useful outside of a Sylvan deck, but great in a Sylvan deck. Um, this is an interesting card. It's one cost for two willpower. Really amazing. And there's no other card that gives you this, I don't think. Um, but if, an, if a character leaves play anywhere on the table, if any character from any player leaves, then you discard the Sylvan Refugee. So this can be great in decks where you have a beefy defender, uh, which we'll see in the Gondor deck has one of the best defenders in the game. If you're playing a deck that isn't intending to lose any characters, this is a great cheap way to get more willpower. So I like this card a lot. It kind of sort of doesn't work in a Sylvan deck, funny enough, because it's all about having allies leave play. So if you choose to take another ally out, then you lose this card too. Um, but it can be useful in some circumstances, and it's a good general use card. Uh, this guy will heal all Sylvan characters in the refresh phase by one. Uh, pretty strong, uh, especially in a Sylvan deck. There's not a lot of Sylvans that have more than one HP, though, that can actually be healed, uh, but I still find some good use for this, and on its own, it's, it's not terrible. Lumbas is an excellent healing card and action advantage. You actually attach this to a hero and you get to ready that hero and heal three damage from it when you, uh, uh, by discarding this card. So it's a one-time use healing and readying effect, but um, really good in a lot of decks. You just have to control a Noldor or Sylvan hero. That's not hard to do. This is Galadriel's key attachment. Nenya is her ring of power. This lets her use her four willpower. Even though she can't quest herself, she can give her willpower to another character. And this grants her the lower resource icon so she can use her resources to pay for spirit and lower cards. Really incredible attachment. Never play a Galadriel deck without her, or without Nenya. This is the most important Sylvan support card. You'll never play this outside of a Sylvan deck, but it reduces the cost of the first Sylvan ally you play uh, by one. So it makes Sylvan allies cheaper to play. Really, really important to have. Wingfoot is a great readying effect. Uh, it's only used for ranger heroes though. So this is great for Barovor from the core set and Haldir in this deck. Um, and if you have an expanded card pool, you can find some other good heroes to use it on, but not too much outside of the core set or this deck. Test of Will is from the core set. It's a staple. It's nice to have extra copies of that. All right, Daron's Runes, one of the best cards in the game. Uh, this you should put in any deck that has a lower hero, period. There is no reason to not include this deck. It essentially shrinks your deck uh, from 50 cards to 47 cards, if you include all three of these. Um, but it also lets you get rid of unique cards that you're not going to use anyway. Um, it's just an excellent, excellent card that lets you draw two cards and you discard one card from your hand. Simple, so, so good. So include this in any lore deck, period. Okay, um, this is an a bonkers good threat reduction card. It costs zero and you get to reduce your threat by three and even get a little willpower bonus. It's ridiculously powerful. All right, uh, Feigned Voices. Now we get to the events that are Sylvan specific as well. This is one of the first bouncing events. This lets you return a Sylvan ally back into your hand 
and then you get to cancel an enemy attack. Really, really cool. It's like Faint from the core set, but it lets you actually return to Sylvan Ally so you can play it later. Um, this is very, very good, and it's free. This is the second, this is probably the most important card in any Sylvan deck. All right, this is another bouncing effect. You return a Sylvan Ally back to your hand, and then you search the top five cards of your deck for a Sylvan Ally, and you put it into play for free. Um, incredible effect. So you can get some really high cost Sylvan Allies into play this way, uh, but it's just a great way to build your board state. Um, this is an auto include in any Sylvan deck. And this as well, this came from the final cycle in the game. This really boosted the Sylvan archetype to just insane levels. Uh, it lets you return all of your Sylvan allies and play all of them again for free. So you get all of those interplay effects all over again. Uh, it, it's incredible. It's a mid game sort of end game card, but it can just win you quests easily. Um, it's so much fun to play. All right, now we get to, the, now this, everything before is sort of the complete deck. Now this card is gonna tell us that everything else is sort of used for extra deck building. Um, oh, that's interesting too. They actually mark these with a star in the lower right corner. Okay, I didn't realize that, that's really cool. So um, these are sort of the sideboard cards you can consider. So you can use these to uh, further deck build or further change your deck. And right off the bat, we start with one of the most powerful heroes in the game, Elrond. Um, he makes the strongest decks in the game, uh, period. He is one of the most expensive heroes from a threat cost perspective, but his stats are incredible. He lets you pay for any allies. You can spend resources from Elrond's resource pool to pay for spirit, leadership, or tactics allies. So you can play any allies in your deck if, if he's on your hero lineup, incredible. And every healing effect is boosted by one. Uh, just bonkers good. And we'll see his key attachment after Vilia. Uh, that also is just completely overpowered. Rumel, super fun, Sylvan card. Um, you're going to need to find some other way to play this in the standard deck like Elrond, <laughs> because there's no tactics hero in the standard deck. Uh, but if you can play him, you count up all of your ranged characters and you get to then do direct damage to enemies based on how many archers you have or ranged characters you have on the table. Really, really fun card to play. So they give you three copies of him. Another great Sylvan ally. This is a tactics one. So when you play him, you deal a damage to an enemy not engaged with you. Really fun. And it's a two cost, two attack. So you can splash this into any tactics decks just fine. It doesn't need to be a Sylvan deck to play. This is an excellent, excellent attachment. Really fun weapon. This is great on Legolas from the core set. Uh, you attach it to a Sylvan character. So you get plus one attack no matter what, but then if you attack an enemy not engaged with you, you get plus two. So if you're gonna get this on Haldir, very fun, uh, one of the heroes in this deck, but if you get it on core set Legolas too, it's really, really great. And this is such a fun card. This is from the Dwarred Elf Cycle. Uh, you exhaust a character you control with ranged, so that would be in this deck, Haldir or Legolas from the core set, and you immediately declare it as an attacker and resolve its attack against an enemy in the staging area. So you get to snipe an enemy in the staging area and you get plus one attack for doing that. So much fun. Um, really great card for any ranged character. Great to take out an enemy. You can even, um, yeah, this is just a general action. So you can even take out an enemy before you resolve the questing. So if you wanna just snipe an enemy to um, you know, get by a certain uh, quest stage quicker, uh, it's, it's incredibly useful for that. This is another Sylvan bouncing card. You return a Sylvan ally and you deal one damage to each enemy engaged with a player. Um, I haven't used this one a whole lot, but again, any Sylvan bouncing card is good in my book. All right, this is Elrond's key attachment. This is his Ring of Power, Vilya. So he can only attach to Elrond. He gains the spirit resource icon, so he can use his resources to pay for spirit attachments or events. Um, but then you exhaust Elrond and Vilya to reveal the top card of your deck, and you can immediately play or put into play the revealed card for no cost, if able. Uh, so <laughs> otherwise a revealed card goes to the bottom of your deck. Now, so you can play any card from your deck for free with this card. It's bonkers good. It makes the strongest decks in the game. 
So I was shocked that it was included in these starter decks, uh, but it can be fun for new players, especially new players that are having a tough time with some of these quests. Now these are just extra copies of cards we've seen. We've already seen all these. All right, everything else we've already seen. That's it for the elves. All right, let's open up the dwarves. Now, historically, in this game, the dwarves have had sort of two flavors to their archetype. The first was sort of a dwarf swarm deck where you just try to get as many allies out on the table as possible and boost them with this hero, Dane Ironfoot. Um, it says, while Dane is ready, dwarf characters get plus one attack, plus one willpower, just straight up. All dwarves get a stat boost as long as he's in a ready state. Um, so if you swarm the board with allies, get his boost, then dwarves, uh, there are a bunch of cards that say if you have five dwarves in play, then you get some boost and bonus. Um, personally, I did not find that version of the dwarf archetype very interesting. Uh, it's just getting a bunch of stats on the table and there wasn't much else going on other than just trying to play as many cards as you could from your hand. Uh, the other flavor was the dwarf, uh, what the community calls dwarf mining. Uh, in this starter pack, they're going to call it delving, uh, where the dwarves are kind of delving into your deck to try to look for treasure. Really fun mechanic. I really liked that version of the dwarves. It was a lot of fun to play. So this starter deck kind of has a little of both. You got some of the bonuses for getting five dwarves in play, but uh, enough of the mining cards are in there that I think this is a great deck for new players. So again, the pamphlet is going to show you kind of your key cards you're looking for. Uh, these cards are the ones that will delve into your deck, and these cards are the treasures you're looking for. These guys are the Arid Luin Miners and your hidden caches. So if you discard one of these from the top of your deck, you get a bonus. This guy you just get as a free ally, and this, this lets you, I think, get two resources. Uh, yeah, two resources to a hero of your choice. Really, really good, fun deck. Um, Dane Ironfoot there in all his glory. Oh, and apparently they added a new trait for him, the noble trait. He didn't have that before, so the starter deck added that. Yeah, minor, pretty fun though. Um, here's the deck list. Again, this was spoiled on Rings DB, so not a surprise to me, but let's crack these open and I'll go through one card at a time. All right, well, I already mentioned Dane Ironfoot. He boosts all dwarf allies in play. Ori is one of the examples of the dwarf swarm, where if you have at least five dwarf characters, then you draw one additional card at the beginning of the resource phase. That's very good. You just try to get dwarves out quickly. Uh, this is an excellent splash hero, meaning you could put this in any deck if you want lore access. He's a low threat cost, seven threat cost is really low, with a great generic ability. Um, you can pay a resource from a hero's resource pool anywhere, <laughs> any hero on the table, and add one resource to Biffer's resource pool and any player may trigger this ability. So it basically smooths out resources. This is something that's sorely missing from the core set, where if you're playing multi-sphere decks, lore has a lot of expensive cards that are hard to pay for. So you can take a resource from leadership, which is flush with resources, and give it to Biffer so you can play, play those expensive lore cards. Excellent hero, really in any deck. All right, this, <laughs> this I think is probably the worst card out of all of the starter decks combined. Uh, no joke, this guy is awful. The only use for Bomber ally, in, from what I could tell, is if there are underground locations in the quest, uh, which is typically the Dwerodalf cycle. So if you're not playing Dwerodalf cycle quests, I would never include Bomber in a deck. Um, Dory is fine, he can, uh, kind of siphon damage away from other characters. He's only got three hit points, so if you can find a way to boost his hit points, um, I think he's pretty good in uh, certain situations, certainly. This is a core set repeat, uh, great in a dwarf mining deck, so I can see why they included all three copies. Uh, this is also potentially a good generic card that can be used in other decks. As long as you have one dwarf character you want to ready, uh, this guy you can exhaust and pay a lower resource to ready a dwarf character, any dwarf character. So if you're maybe building a Gimli deck from the core set, if you want to ready Gimli multiple times to get that crazy attack uh, multiple times, you can include this in the deck to ready him multiple times. So really, really cool. There's no limit to that readying effect. It's just as long as you can pay the resources, you can ready him. All right, this we already mentioned too. Uh, this is the card you're looking to try to discard through all of these uh, delving 
mechanics in, in this deck. If you can discard cards off the top of your deck and find him, then you get to play him for free. Uh, really, really fun card. Fun fact, this is the only card that was included from the Dream Chaser cycle in these starter decks. Uh, I think Caleb made a special exception. Uh, Caleb's the designer. Uh, he made a special exception to include this because it's just so good in a dwarf deck. It's kind of essential for this mining mechanic to work. All right, this came from the Against the Shadows cycle. I'm glad they included this because it's also great for the dwarf mining mechanic. Uh, only cost two, so not too bad at all. And boosted with uh, Dane's stats, he is a great quester. All right, they included more Corset Gandalf. In this deck, they included three copies. Gloin, he is a hero in the core set. Here's his ally version. If you have at least five dwarf characters, then you can add two resources to that hero's resource pool when you play him. Um, pretty good. Yeah, he's unique, so you can only have one of them on the table. I never really, I don't know, I didn't really ever understand this guy. I think he's fun in multiplayer. Not so great solo, but in multiplayer, you can quest with him and then tell everybody else what's coming on top of the deck. Uh, so it's a useful kind of a scrying ability, uh, but he costs three. I kind of wish he cost a little less than that, but anyway, he's fine. Another corset repeat. Cram. I really like Cram. I don't know if it's that popular of a card because there's other good readying abilities in the card pool, but it's simple. Cost zero, you attach to a hero, and you discard Cram to ready the hero. It's super simple, but it it does fill a niche in the core set that's kind of missing. There aren't that many readying effects, especially cheap ones like this. So I'm glad the cram is in here. This is a great uh, healing effect. It costs zero, so you can heal all damage from one character. Um, yeah, it's useful for maybe like a glowing deck and from the core set if you need to heal a bunch of damage from one hero, it's great for that. Now this is an excellent, excellent, powerful card. Uh, one of the best card draw effects in leadership, period. Uh, so all you need is a dwarf hero to play this, and it doesn't matter which dwarf hero it goes on, uh, but you get to draw the top two, or you look at the top two cards of your deck, you can add one to your hand and then discard the other. Uh, so this works with the delving mechanic. So if you find a hidden cache or an Erdluin miner, you can discard that to then get the bonus. But this, you're looking at two cards, two extra cards every single round and drawing one. So it's just really good as a generic card draw effect. You can include this in any deck as long as you're playing a dwarf hero and the leadership sphere. I love this card. All right, this is a standard dwarf deck staple. Every time you play a dwarf character from your hand, you get to draw a card. You do that once per round, but um, I would not ever play this outside of a dwarf deck. Now, this is cool. This could be played outside of a dwarf deck for sure. Uh, this lets you uh, do some resource smoothing. You can play cards from any sphere um, until the end of the phase. So it's a little expensive, but it's an excellent dwarf card. Thor's map. This is for location control. Uh, this is a one-time use now. This got eroded because it was uh, kind of broken uh, be previously. It used to be a repeatable effect. Now it's a one-time use. You discard this to use it. Uh, still good though. Uh, you get to make a location in the staging area, the active location, without triggering the travel effect. So if there's a nasty travel effect on a location, you could ignore it with Thor's map. Great card. This is a ridiculously powerful card, a very good tale. It lets you exhaust two allies to discard the top five cards of your deck. So this works with the, the delving mechanic in dwarfs, but you can use this in any leadership deck. So sorry, you exhaust two allies and then you add up the cost of those allies and then you can play allies from those five cards you just discarded as long as the cost doesn't exceed the cost of those two allies you exhausted. Um, Sorry, that's a little complicated, but basically it lets you uh, exhaust two allies to play two more allies or up to two more allies on the board. So it accelerates your board state and lets you get more allies on the table faster. It's a great, very powerful card. Uh, and you can do some shenanigans uh, with the Corset Gandalf ally. Uh, you can exhaust him at some interesting times to get this to trigger. Um, won't go into detail on that, but it's a really fun card. All right, this is the core 
uh, delving card. If you get to discard this from the from your deck, then you get two resources. It's so much fun to get to find it. It really feels like you're find, finding buried treasure when you find that. So, excellent card. Um, ready all dwarf characters. Yeah, this is extremely strong in a dwarf deck. Um, wouldn't use it outside of a dwarf deck. All right, this is a fun card. It looks at first like it's a dwarf card, like you wouldn't play this outside of a dwarf deck, but in fact, you can include this in any deck with leadership, and I'll explain why in a second. But the text says, exhaust X dwarf heroes to add X resources to a hero's resource pool and draw one card. So if you exhaust two dwarf heroes, you can add two resources to a hero you control. Um, or actually to a hero, so you, anywhere on the table. So you can get some resources for this, but so that's good in a dwarf deck, but this draw one card basically means that for zero cost, you can replace this card in your hand with a different card. So essentially what this can do is if you include three of this in any leadership deck, it thins your deck from 50 cards to 47 cards. Um, because this replaces itself for no cost. If you draw this, you just discard it and draw another one. Uh, so it makes, it makes any leadership deck more consistent. Uh, so you can draw all the rest of your cards more often um, by including this. So it's an excellent general use card. You'll see this in a lot of deck lists on RingsDB, and that's why, because you just replace it even if you don't use the, uh, the other effect. All right, this is a fun boosting card for dwarfs. You wouldn't use it outside of a dwarf deck. I, well, I guess you could. As long as you have a dwarf hero, you can use it. But that's it for the standard deck. Uh, this will tell us that everything behind it is sort of in the sideboard. You can use it to tweak this deck or just use it in any other uh, deck you want. All right, this hero is incredible. Uh, I would usually recommend replacing, uh, I think, Biffer with Nori if you want an easy kind of way to change up this deck. Uh, Nori is an excellent, excellent card. Every time you play a dwarf character, you reduce your threat by one. So you can start, uh, well, you can play games with zero threat on your threat dial with him in play. All right, Keeley goes with his brother, Feely, because if you play one of these cards, Feely or Keeley, then you get to fetch the other one. So this is excellent for getting those five dwarves on the table quickly, uh, if you include these in your deck. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You can include this in generic decks, I suppose, um, if you just need some kind of generic allies or more allies on the table. Uh, always fine to play. Zigil Miner is a great general use card. This lets you get resources in spirit. Typically, leadership is the sphere that gets all the resource generation, but this is one of the few resource generation in spirit, so you can include this in any spirit deck. Uh, but it also feeds into the, the delving mechanic, because you uh, discard the top two cards of your deck, and if you guess an, if you guess the resource cost ahead of time correctly, then you get to gain resources. Uh, so it's kind of a fun little gambling thing, uh, but it, it just, yeah, it, it's, it's a great ally, great card overall. All right, this is an excellent generic use card as well. It does let you feed into the delving mechanic by discarding two cards. You reduce the cost of this ally by two. So honestly, there's almost no situation where you wouldn't trigger that response to reduce his cost. So just think of this guy as a two cost ally with two defense, three hit points, and sentinel. I would include this in lots of spirit decks, even if I don't play any other dwarves. I think it's a great card. All right, dwarf pipe. This is really only used in dwarf mining decks or dwarf delving decks. Um, you get to take cards from your discard pile and put them back in your deck. Uh, very useful. You could also use it in a pipe deck, but uh, that's, <laughs> that's pretty niche. All right, magic ring. This is a really fun card. Uh, this came from the Haradrim cycle. It's limit one per hero and one per deck. So you're not even allowed to include three copies of this in your deck. Uh, so that's why they only give you one copy of this in the starter deck. However, it just gives you lots of options. Cards that give you options are always good. That's why Corset Gandalf is great, because you get to pick from three of his options when you play him. So this, you can exhaust the ring and raise your threat by one, ouch, but you get to heal a damage from the attached hero, add a resource to the attached hero, or ready the attached hero. 
uh, this is just fun. It's, it's great to have options like this. Uh, you could stick this in almost any deck and, and be well off. Oh, Bomber, we don't need you. Get out of here. Dory, just extra copies. I think all the other cards, let me just double check. I think all these are just duplicates of what we've already seen. Yep, just extra copies. All right, well, that's it for the Dwarf deck. All right, let's crack open the Gondor deck. Now, historically in the game, this archetype had a couple of different flavors. The first flavor they introduced was all about um, gaining resources, moving resources around, and trying to put resources on certain heroes like Boromir here uh, to get stat boosts on your allies. And then in addition to that, you'd want to get as many allies on the board as possible with those stat boosts to just overwhelm the enemy. Uh, so you could kind of see this hinted at in the core set with the four Gondor event, which boosted Gondor allies. So get a hint of it there. So that version of the archetype, I didn't find terribly useful. I just don't like pure swarm decks very much. Uh, but later on in the game cycle, they started introducing uh, what, uh, what's called a Valor mechanic, or cards that get boosted when your threat is over 40. And that I found really interesting. So we'll see some of these later, but Angbor the Fearless, for instance, when your threat is 40 or higher, he gets plus two attack. There's a bunch of different effects that will benefit you from having a high threat. I think that's fun because it's like playing with fire, but it also gives an arc to the, to, to the, to the gameplay. It's like you're starting a little bit weaker, but as you build then into the end game, when your threat's high, you get this extra push and you get an extra strength. I just think that's a lot of fun. Um, so there's the deck list, and let's go through these one at a time. All right, starting with the captain of Gondor himself, if he has at least one resource in his resource pool, then Gondor allies get plus one attack. This is kind of the foundation for the swarm mechanic. Uh, Prince Immerhill is from the first cycle in the game. After a character leaves play, ready Prince Immerhill. Uh, that's limit once per round. So uh, there are several cards in here that you want to chump block with. Our chump blocking is sort of like a weak ally that you don't mind losing just to kind of feed to the wolves and you get to profit. So this is one of those examples where you can feed a squire of the citadel to the to the wolves and then you get to ready him for free. So that's a cool little sub mechanic, sub theme in this in this deck. Mablong is from the fourth cycle. He's great. This card can be used in any uh, any variety of tactics decks, he lets you gain resources every time you engage an enemy, uh, once per phase at least. So if an enemy engages you in the quest phase and you get to engage an enemy in the engagement phase, that's two resources extra in one round. He's very, very powerful. All right, this guy was from the very last cycle in the game. He's bonkers good. Two costs for two willpower in leadership is kind of unheard of. And in addition, he can get up to three attack when you're in Valor mode. Uh, and two hit points. He's ridiculously good. And it's unique, so you can only have one of them. But, like, yeah, th th this guy is, is an excellent, excellent ally. All right, this is sort of the generic Gondor ally that we were waiting for for a long time. This guy came out in the last cycle in the game. Uh, but he lets you search your deck for additional Gondor allies when you play him, so it kind of fuels into the uh, the swarm mechanic. But he's got, you know, well-balanced stats overall, so uh, a great card to use in a Gondor deck. And when you're in uh, Valor mode, or 40 threat or higher, then you get to search your entire deck. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, no, no. Uh, this, you get to add any number of Gondor allies from the top five cards of your deck. So if you draw, you know, three Gondor allies, you get to add them all to your hand. That's very, very cool. Okay, this guy is one of the sort of generic dwarf, uh, not dwarf, Gondor swarm allies. You lower his cost to play by one for each Gondor ally you have in play. So it starts at five cost, but if you've got five allies already in play, then he's free. Uh, that's kind of cool. All right, this is one of the best tactics allies in the entire game by far. Two cost for four defense. This solves a lot of new player problems. There aren't a lot of defensive options in the core set. Uh, this is an instant two cost to get four defense. Uh, it, no ability, but you don't need one. This is just incredibly useful on his own. And if you can find ways to boost his defense and hit points, even better. 
All right. This is a card I'm not a huge fan of. It does work in the Gondor deck. He's a Gondor guy. Uh, when you play him, you get to move a resource from the resource pool of a hero you control to another hero. So you could pass a resource across the table with him, but his stats are just kind of meh. So it's fine in a Gondor deck, but he's not great. There are better cards. This is one of the best cards in the game, in my opinion. This is an excellent card. One cost, two hit points, so we can soak up a little bit of damage, maybe some archery damage in some of the saga quests. You definitely need some uh, some archery soaking. But um, that that's not what you get him for. You get him for his ability. You exhaust him to move one resource from the resource pool of a hero you control to another hero's resource pool. This is the ultimate resource smoothing card. What that means is if you're playing multiple spheres uh, on your heroes, like a tri-sphere deck, it's very difficult to balance the resources where you want them. So you may have resources pile up on one hero, but you need them on another hero. With this, you can balance and smooth out the resources and move the resources where you need them at any time. But you can also use this guy to pass resources across the table. This I would include in almost any leadership deck because it's just that good. Excellent card. I'm really glad they included this. All right, Faramir's from the core set. It's great to have additional copies because he's very good. Also, Gandalf from the core set. Great. Oh, and we've got Gondoran Spearman also from the core set. Don't worry, though, about the corset repeats. There are plenty of excellent new cards, including this one. This is an excellent card. It's neutral, so you can put it in any deck, and it fits in any deck. It is so good. You pay two cost, but then after you play it, after it enters play, you add one resource to a Gondor or Noble Heroes resource pool. There are a ton of Noble Heroes in the game, so this restriction isn't that restrictive. But essentially that means you get to also do some resource smoothing. You can move a resource, uh, you know, paying for this cost with any hero's resources and then add a resource to anyone else that's Noble or Gondor. Uh, incredibly useful. You can pass this across the table. You can smooth out your own resources uh, and you get a one willpower uh, and one attack ally from it with two hit points. So also can soak up some damage. Um, you can kind of think of this as a one cost ally, but the ability to smooth out resources is just excellent. The fact that it's neutral means you can put it in any deck and I recommend that. All right, Squire of the Citadel is the ultimate chump blocker. Uh, you feed him to the wolves and you profit. So you cost one, but then after he leaves play, you add a resource to a Gondor hero's resource pool. So it essentially costs zero, but he can block an attack for you. Uh, it's kind of funny. You just feed the boy. <laughs> I think it's the meme that went around when this guy came out. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. All right, this is a great card, general use. You attach him to a warrior hero, and when you engage an enemy, you can add an attack and a defense for the end of the round. This is a great card. It's unique, so you can only have one of them in play, but very good. This is one of the best defensive cards in the game. Uh, it's one cost. You can attach it to any hero. You can only have one of them on a hero, limit one per hero. It's restricted, but you can put it on any hero to gain one defense, but if it's a Gondor hero, he gains two defense. Two defense for one cost is bonkers. And again, in the core set especially, there's a lot of miss, um, there's not many defensive options. So having a, just a great shield, so, so good to have. This is also an excellent uh, general use card. Uh, you attach it to a noble hero, and after that hero gains resources from a card effect, you can exhaust this card to ready that hero. So there are tons of card effects that gain you resources. So you can get very creative with that. I mean, Steward of Gondor is the easiest one that comes into mind, but Gloin has a built-in card effect that gives him resources. So every time Gloin takes damage, you can ready him with this card. Um, there's lots of ways to use this. I like this card a lot, um, so I'm glad it's in here. And extra copies of the core set, Staple, Steward of Gondor, always nice to have. Valiant Sword, this is from the final cycle. It's great, I love having this. It's just a generic sword. You can use this in any leadership deck. It goes on a noble hero, again, not as restrictive as you might think, because there's a ton of noble heroes out there. Um, but if you're in Valor mode, or 40 threat or higher, you get plus two attack. Um, 
Really good card. Even just having the one attack bonus is great to have. So that's Valiant Sword and... Okay, Visionary Leadership is the core Gondor card enabler. Uh, put this on Boromir and while he has one resource, then Gondor characters get plus one willpower. Add that to his plus one attack and you can start to see how good this deck can get. So try to find this card as early as you can when you're playing it. Okay, Behind Strong Walls is another great defensive card. You get to ready a defending Gondor character. That character gets plus one until the end of the phase. All right, so one little clarification here. That plus one defense doesn't apply only to the second defense that character would do. It applies to both defenses. You'd want to play this basically before you resolve the damage of the first defense. That way you can get the plus one defense bonus for the first defense and it carries then forward to this, whatever the second defense they do. So uh, better than you might think at first because you can use that defense bonus twice. All right, Faint is a duplicate from the core set. Excellent staple card. All right, Need Drives Them is a great card. This is sort of like a cheaper version of Grim Resolve from the core set. Grim Resolve let you, it was a five cost event that let you ready all characters. This is a three cost that lets you ready all characters for each player that is 40 threat or higher. So this would be an end game card. If everyone is above 40, then you ready all characters. It's the same as Grim Resolve in that case. Uh, but you know, even if you need to ready all characters from one player that has 40 threat or higher, it's still great and worth the three cost in my opinion. So great in this deck. All right, this, I believe this came from the final cycle in the game. This is sort of another enabler for the Valor strategy. Um, this lets you keep your threat, um, actually, it's a little bit of a complicated card, honestly. Um, this lets you, you can do a few things with this. Um, you can play this when you're at low threat to raise your threat to 40 so you instantly go into Valor mode. So if you want to kick in all those Valor bonuses, then you can play this and it's free if your threat is below 40. Okay, so you set your threat to 40. If this effect raised your threat, then you draw a card. You draw four cards instead if this raised your threat by 10 or more. Um, that's really, really good. So this little draw four cards if it raised your threat by 10 or more, that's not really gonna work in this included deck because the threat costs are too high. You're starting at 32 threat, so this effect down here is not gonna trigger because you need to be at 30 threat or below to get that draw four card bonus. But it's still good because if your threat is higher than 40, let's say you're at 49 threat, you're about to lose. You can pay four cost and leadership to reduce your threat down to 40 again. That's reducing your threat by potentially nine for four cost and leadership. That's actually really, really good. So anyway, sorry, this is a complicated card, but it's, it's a really good one for the Valor deck uh, to keep your threat around that sweet spot of 40. All right, this is a core set repeat. Faux Hammer. This is an excellent card. This is the best tactics card draw event. So I'm really glad they included this. Um, after a hero you control attacks and destroys an enemy, exhaust a weapon card attached to that hero to draw three cards. So it's a bit restrictive. You need to have a weapon attached to a hero and kill an enemy with that hero. Then you can draw three cards for killing an enemy. Uh, so this is great for Legolas when you get above the Galadrim, for instance, or uh, uh, you know, any, any one of the uh, corset weapons attached. Um, it's, it's just so good to draw three cards for zero cost though. So once you get a weapon on a guy that can kill, um, excellent card draw effect for that. All right, so the rest are in the sideboard. Let's see what's after the halt card. This, Baragond, is one of the best heroes in the entire game. Um, Four defense, four hit points is bonkers, and he's sentinel, so he is the best defending hero in the game. Um, I, I suppose arguably there's spirit dying, but uh, he's uh, 
<laughs> he's, he, he's got some different uses. So Baragond, he's Sentinel. He lowers the cost to play weapon and armor attachments on him by two. So he can make a Citadel plate cost two. You can attach the Gondorian shield for free. Lots of fun options for getting attachments on him, but he is the best defender in the game by far. Faramir was a surprise to me. I was not expecting this in this deck. Um, Faramir really fits into the trap deck archetype, which is a completely different type of deck to play than the standard Gondor deck here, but it's a lot of fun. And so what you need for Faramir are traps that will let enemies stay in the staging area because Faramir gets an attack boost for each enemy in the staging area. Um, there's a card that lets you trap enemies up there so you can get his attack boost off. The only problem with Faramir, though, is that he starts at a high threat of 11. So you need either threat reduction or you need to pick heroes with a low threat cost in order to also try to keep enemies in the staging area to make best use of his ability. He is range, which is great. But um, anyway, so you just got to build around him a little bit to make him work. But he is a lot of fun when you get it. Uh, firing. All right, this is a card from the Haradrim cycle that also feeds into the trap deck archetype. Um, basically fixes the, the willpower questing problem that a lot of trap decks had before. So if you trap an enemy, then this guy can quest for whatever the threat strength of that trapped enemy is. So if you can trap like a three threat strength enemy, this guy's questing for three. That's really good for two cost. So, fun ally to play. All right, this is the card I was talking about. So if you put three Ranger Spikes in your deck, then you can get Faramir's boosted pretty easily. Uh, this is an excellent card in any lore deck, though, period. I mean, this is just an excellent card. Uh, you play it into the staging area. It's a trap. Um, and if unattached, you attach Ranger Spikes to the next eligible enemy that enters the staging area. So when you're in the staging step, you reveal an enemy, boom, he falls into the ranger spikes, and then players don't make engagement checks against the attached enemy. So that they stay in the staging area, they never have to leave. And then the attached enemy gets minus two threat strength. So you're not worried about keeping a high threat strength enemy in there because it's reduced. In many cases, it then it becomes a zero threat strength enemy that can stay up there forever. You never have to attack it ever again. So really fun trap card. Works with uh, Faramir, but really works in any lore deck too. A lot of fun. This is another trap. Um, it's cheaper, and when it attaches to an enemy, then any character may choose the attached enemy as a target of an attack. So any character on the board can attack that guy in the staging area or engage with another player, sort of like everyone gets ranged against that enemy. It's a lot of fun. It's cheap. Um, I like the card. All right, this card is from the Haradrim cycle. It's a little restrictive in that you have to have a ranger, uh, a unique character with the ranger trait and another unique character with the warrior trait. But if you meet that condition, then after you engage an enemy, that enemy cannot attack you until the end of the round. So it's sort of like a boosted feint from the core set. Feint was a tactics card. You could prevent an attack in one phase. This prevents attacks for the entire round. So if an enemy engages you in the quest phase, it would normally attack you then and also in the combat phase. You get two attacks from that enemy. This can block that enemy for the entire round so it's very good um, as long as you meet that condition. All right, Helm of Secrecy was a complete surprise to me. This is a, a singleton card because it's limit one per deck, so you only get one copy of it, not a big deal. Um, this came from the final cycle in the game. It essentially lets you trade one of your heroes for a different hero in the middle of the game. Uh, so sort of like, uh, hey, just kidding, I'm not Faramir, I'm... Boromir, or I don't know, someone else. Um, a lot of fun uses for this. I haven't used it in a deck personally, but I think it is fun to have. This is also another limit one per deck card, so you only get one copy of it, but it doesn't matter. Uh, this is a fun, fun card. Costs four, um, so it's expensive, but <laughs> totally worth it because heroes do not exhaust to attack, defend, 
or commit to a quest while the attached location is the active location. So you can, this is a comeback card, really. If you get this off at the right time, you can clear a board of all the enemies on the table pretty easily. A lot of fun to use. And I believe all the rest of these cards are gonna be duplicates that we've already seen. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, let's get to the last deck. All right, let's crack open the last one, the Rohan. Now, historically, Rohan has had sort of an identity crisis with their archetype. They couldn't really land on one thing that Rohan does. Um, there's a lot of different types of Rohan decks that you can build. Uh, I like this one that Caleb designed. It's fun to play. The general idea here is that it's a cavalry charge. So you play allies, they attack, they do something cool, and then they leave, they retreat. Um, so, and then certain cards will get boosted when they leave. Like Aomir here, he's kind of the, the crux of the archetype here. When a character leaves play, Aomir gets plus two attack until the end of the round. So you trigger this with other cards that can boost when they leave play, and you get some really strong turns with this deck. It's a lot of fun. There's also some mount attachments and um, a lot of good general use cards in here as well. There's the deck list. Um, but let's go through these cards one at a time. All right, well, starting off with Aomir, we already mentioned him, but every time an ally leaves play, he gets boosted. Uh, so we're going to see a lot of cards that are going to leave play uh, and boost him up. Hirgon is an interesting hero. I was not expecting him in this deck. It works really well, but he's not a Rohan character. Uh, in the books, he delivered the Red Arrow to um, King Theoden to bring them to war in Pelennor Fields. So, uh, you know, there's thematic tie-in there, but he's a Gondor character. Uh, you can use him in a lot of different decks. It's a lot of fun. Uh, but basically, when he quests successfully, you get to play a Tactics Ally from your hand and reduce the cost by one. So it's easier, it's just a cost reduction in Tactics alone is really good because Tactics usually has problems with resources. Uh, but then on top of that, you can raise your threat by one to give the ally an attack and defense boost. But that's after you see the staging step. So you get to see what enemies are coming up and if you need some extra boost, then you can trigger his ability. So really fun hero, even outside of a Rohan deck. Lethereal is an excellent Rohan card that kind of revitalized the archetype. So really glad Caleb included this in this deck. Uh, three willpower for eight um, threat cost already is, is good. And if, she, if Aomir is in play, then she gains the Rohan trait. So she is a Rohan Gondor noble. But here's her thing. After she commits to a quest, you choose an ally in your hand. And if the ally shares a trait with her, that's where the trait boost helps. So if the ally is noble Gondor or Rohan, then you put the ally into play exhausted and committed to the quest. You don't pay for the ally, you just put the ally into play, exhausted and committed to quest. So they're questing for free, and then at the end of that questing phase, if that ally is still in play, you shuffle it into your deck. So if you trigger her ability every round, then Aomir gets boosted every round guaranteed because that ally will leave play in the quest phase. So together, uh, their husband and wife in the book, at the very end, uh, they get married. So really fun thematic combo for the Rohan deck. All right, we mentioned Aomond, I believe, but after he leaves play, you ready all Rohan characters in play. Uh, very strong, so if you quest him with Ethereal, you can get an amazing turn out of him, and they include Plenty of copies of him in the deck. Escort from Edoras, also amazing with Lothiriel. I didn't play this ally much without her, but with her, you don't pay his cost, but he quests for four. It's a four willpower ally that with Lothiriel is free. So really, really fun Rohan card in that case. You could use it in a generic deck, but I, I tend not to. Gandalf, corset staple. Great, you got two copies of him. Guthloth. Um, fun ally, if one Rohan hero is in play, you lower his cost by one, so it's a two-cost ally with two defense and two will, two hit points, eh, it's okay. But if there's a Gondor hero, he gains Sentinel. Now that's pretty cool, so he can defend some weaker enemies across the table. I like that. 
Horseback Archer, kind of a funny include from the core set. He's generally not liked very much because he's really expensive, but with Here Gone, he only costs two. So two costs for two attack and ranged, that's actually really good. This guy is the attack equivalent of the Escort from Edoras. He attacks for four on the turn he attacks, and then at the end of that attack, you discard him. So uh, can boost Aomir when he's in there and give a really good attack boost that one turn. All right, this is an excellent two cost, two willpower ally in spirit. You can include this in any spirit deck and be just fine. Um, it's always nice to have that efficient two cost for two stats. Um, after you play her though, you can switch the active location with any other location so you can bypass a nasty travel effect. Excellent ability, she's good without it, but even with it, she's even better. So, great ally. This ally is pretty good, sort of a, a, an emergency uh, kill switch, maybe you could say. Two cost, de you know, not great stats, fine to have the willpower, but you can discard this card to choose and ready a hero. So great in a pinch to be able to ready a hero that you need for that one extra attack or one extra defense you need. This is a great card, one cost for one willpower, I'll take that, but then she searches the top 10 cards of your deck for a mount. We're gonna see some mount cards in here, uh, but this is a, a very good card if you have mounts in your deck. All right, Westfold Lancer. This came from the last cycle in the game. It's a little expensive at first, but you get two willpower in tactics is very rare. So I'd say that alone is worth the cost if you're running tactics. But with Hiragon, he's only costing two, so even better. And then if he quests successfully, you can discard this card to choose a non-unique enemy in the staging area, and deal two damage to the chosen enemy. This combined with some other direct damage effects like Thalon from the core set can be really fun to get rid of enemies in the staging area. I like it. All right, this is one of the best tactics allies in the game, period. It's two cost for two attack with two hit points and a defense. So very versatile even to attack, or to defend a weaker enemy, getting two attack. These are actually the same stats as the veteran Axe Hand from the core set, but the veteran Axe Hand had no ability, and this guy has a very useful ability. So as an action, you can discard this card to choose an enemy not engaged with you and engage the enemy. So you can do this during the quest phase. Before you resolve the questing, you can pull an enemy from the staging area to you and get that threat strength out of the area to attack it later. Extremely versatile. You can use this in a lot of situations. Even during the combat phase, it can be really handy. So excellent stats, excellent ability. I would use this in any tactics deck. This is an excellent card draw effect in Spirit. There aren't many card draw effects in Spirit, so this was from the first cycle. Really good card. You draw three cards after exploring a location this is attached to. Um, excellent to have. And sorely needed in this deck. You need lots of card draw in this deck. Firefoot is the first mount. This goes straight on Aomir. It gives him a two attack boost. And uh, I guess what's called a trample effect in some other card games, um, if he uh, oh gosh, what is this? Yeah, after the attached hero attacks alone, so Aramir has to attack alone by himself, you exhaust Firefoot to choose a non-unique enemy engaged with you. Excess damage dealt by this attack is assigned to the chosen enemy. So with this, and assuming an ally left play that round, Aramir has seven attack by himself with this attachment. So seven attack strength. If you can kill a weak enemy, then you can do direct damage to another stronger enemy as an overflow. All the excess damage can go to it. So you can easily kill two enemies with this card. Uh, very, very strong card. Horn of the Mark also came out in the last cycle of the game. This sort of, with Lethereal, sort of revi um, revitalized the, the Rohan archetype because this provided the needed card draw. Because uh, once per round, after a character leaves play, you get to draw a card to replace it. So really important in this deck. I would say try to mulligan to get this in the deck. The Red Arrow. This is a limit one per deck card, so you only get one copy of it. Uh, but you only need one because it's, it's a very good card. Uh, you get plus one willpower. 
to a Gondor hero, so you could put this on Hirogon, very thematic. But then if your threat is 40 or higher, that's what Valor means, if you're 40 or higher threat, then after this hero quest successfully, you get to search the top five cards of your deck for an ally and put it into play for free. Really strong effect, really fun. And even just one cost for the one extra willpower in tactics, I'd use it just for that. War Axe is a fun generic attachment. Most attachments attach to heroes, but this one can go on any tactics character, which is pretty fun. Uh, you can only have one axe on each character, but the attached character gets plus one attack for each attachment it has with the restricted keyword. So try to get two restricted attachments on the character, but then this becomes a plus two attack. So that's pretty fun. All right, another more copies of Test of Will is always good in my book. That's one of the best core set cards in, my, in the game. Astonishing Speed is a, a, sort of a mid to late game uh, quest boost that's insane in the right circumstance. All your Rohan characters get plus two willpower. That is just really, really good. It's a little expensive, but if you can get it, it's very good. Faint is a core set repeat, staple, really good card. Fourth, Aerolingas. Each Rohan hero can be declared as an attacker against enemies in the staging area. Uh, very interesting. I would say you're not attacking with any of the other Rohan cards, especially in this deck. So this basically could have just said, Aomir can attack in the staging area. Um, really fun, really good. There are some other uses for this, of course, uh, and it only fits in a Rohan deck, but it's pretty cool to be able to attack the staging area. All right, this came from the Haradrim cycle. Uh, it's a little restrictive in that you need a Rohan hero, or sorry, a unique character with the Rohan trait and another unique character with the Gondor trait. So this starter deck meets that instantly because you've got both Aramir and Hirgon, which are Gondor and Rohan, so you don't worry about that in this deck. But um, if you meet that condition, then at the beginning of the combat phase, you resolve the step in which you attack enemies before resolving the enemy attacks. So this only applies to you, you know, the one playing the card, but you get to attack first and you don't have to deal with defenses. So if you can kill the enemy before they attack you, uh, then it's sort of like you fainted the enemy and canceled their attack. This can be really strong. I like that this is in this deck. This also came in the final cycle. This sort of fixed another problem with Rohan in that it was very difficult to find the Rohan allies in time to play them. This is just an excellent card. So. Each Rohan hero you control is considered to have spirit when you play this card. So it will give Aomir the spirit icon so you can play, pay the four cost a little bit easier. But when you play it, you search the top 10 cards of your deck for up to four Rohan allies and put them into play for free. And then if any of those allies are still in play at the end of the round, you discard them. So put them into play and then just use their discard abilities because they're going away anyway. So you can ready a hero and you know, put progress on a location and kill an enemy in the staging area and, you know, all, all those kind of leave play effects. You just trigger all of them because they're all going anyway. All right. This is a great general use tactics card. Um, it, not just for Rohan decks. So at the beginning of the quest phase, you search the top five cards of the encounter deck for an enemy and you put it into play, engage with you, so it doesn't stick in the staging area. It's not adding its threat strength. It goes right to you and then you reveal one less encounter card this phase. This is so good because if you're, if you're a tactics deck and you need enemies to kill, you're not questing, you're not helping the other player's quest usually. Um, you want to pull enemies from the encounter deck. So this essentially guarantees that you're not only going to find an enemy, it forces you to find an enemy in the top five cards, um, but then you get to engage it immediately, so you are kind of helping with the quest and that you're removing threat strength, and then that becomes your card that you revealed from the encounter deck. So this is such a good card for tactics. If you're looking for enemies, then you can guarantee it, essentially, as long as there's one in the top five cards. I like this card quite a bit. Okay, this is the rest of the sideboard. Let's see what we got. All right, Fast Red is the defending hero in this starter set. Um, I'm probably going to use him. Oh gosh, I don't know who I would replace. But he's really good. Three defense, three hit points. 
Um, fast Shot is a really interesting ability. After you defend an attack, you return the enemy to the staging area to reduce your threat by two. Seems a little counterproductive in that you, you're then not able to kill that enemy after. The threat reduction is amazing, but what you can use this with is another core set card, Dune Hero. So I rarely use this guy in decks, but this guy attacks into the staging area and he gets an attack bonus for doing it. So what you can do is you can defend with Fast Red, push the enemy in the staging area, and then attack him with Dune here with an attack boost. So these guys pair extremely well together. I'm excited to try some decks out by using this uh, Corset Hero. All right, Rittermark's Finest is another Spirit Rohan ally. You get to exhaust him and discard him to place two progress tokens on any location. So in the core set, there's quite a few locations with only two quest points. So you can ex you know blow up a location without traveling to it with this ally. It's pretty good. And it's got two hit points, one willpower, one attack. This is not a bad ally at all to include in pretty much any spirit deck. Spear of the Mark. All right, this guy, uh, you could basically say this goes on... Dune here from the core set because this gives an attack boost of plus two when you attack an enemy in the staging area. So extremely good on Dune here. Uh, but it goes on a Rohan character, so you could put this on even an ally that has the Rohan trait. So that could be pretty cool. All right, Steed of the Mark is sort of a niche card in my opinion. I don't, I don't think I'm going to use this card very often. It's just very expensive for what it does. So first of all, you have to put it on a Gondor or a Rohan hero. That's already a little restrictive. But after the attached hero commits to a quest, spend a resource from the attached hero's resource pool to ready them. So this is actually the same ability as Aragorn from the core set. Um, so you can give that Aragorn ability to anyone, which seems good, but you're paying one cost for that, and then you're paying one cost every time after. So already the first time you use this card, it's the same cost as Unexpected Courage, which can go on any hero. And then after that, this is always more expensive every time thereafter, because you're spending a resource each time. So you have to use this in sort of an emergency situation where you really just need that last little push. You're not going to use this often, I don't think. Um, so for that, I'm not a huge fan of the card, but if you need a mount, this could be a decent include. All right, Rohan Warhorse, this is an excellent tactics card. Can be used really well with uh, like the Corset Legolas or Aomir here. You attach to a tactics or Rohan hero. So I like that it can go on any tactics hero. It's restricted, but then after you kill an enemy, you get to ready this, uh, ready the hero again. So you can get two attacks out of one hero as long as you destroy that first enemy. Very good card for your strongest attacker. All right, Charge of the Rohirrim. This is exclusively, uh, I would say, a Rohan card because it's each Rohan character with a mount attachment gets plus three attack. I... Maybe in a pinch you could use it with Aramir, but I don't think I would ever use that card. All right, Guthlaf. Oh, and everything else after here should be a duplicate. Let me double check here. Yup, 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 yup. Okay, that's it for the Rohan deck. All right, let me wrap this up with some of my final thoughts, some analysis, and which ones of these I think you should buy. One of the most interesting findings is that there were no cards included from three cycles, Angmar Awakened, Arid Mithrin, and Dream Chaser. Okay, except for one card, which I showed you before, one of the dwarf cards. So Caleb Grace is the lead designer on this game. He's had the most influence on the game for the longest period of time. He's the one who built these starter decks. And he specifically said that when he was building these decks, he avoided those cycles that were going to get reprinted as future products. Uh, basically, he didn't want Fantasy Flight to step on their own toes by discouraging newer players from buying those future products. If they happen to get these starter decks, they didn't want them to feel um, cheated out because they were going to buy a bunch of duplicates. Um, so that makes sense, right? Um, so that was basically a full confirmation that Angmar Awaken, Arid Mithrin, and Dream Chaser were the first three cycles that will be reprinted and repackaged in the new format, the new two-box format, the campaign expansion and the hero expansion. Um, and lo and behold, a couple weeks later, Fantasy Flight did announce that Angmar Awaken is the first repackaged cycle. So as of the making of this video, we haven't heard any other announcements, but that did confirm that first cycle is being announced. And um, 
I think it's great. Uh, I think it's wonderful that this is a great way to start um, start into the game and then you can get these new cycles being reprinted without getting any duplicates. Uh, I think that's fantastic. Now another interesting finding is that there were no cards included from this Lord of the Rings saga boxes. Uh, there were quite a few taken from the Hobbit saga boxes, but the Lord of the Rings sagas, uh, those were untouched. And those are some of the most popular expansions, one that new players will probably want to buy anyway. So that either means that Fantasy Flight will continue to reprint the Lord of the Rings saga boxes as is in the old format, or there may be a new repackaging of those saga expansions as well. Um, however, one of the main changes they're making to these other cycles that they're repackaging is they're adding in a campaign element. But there's already a campaign in the Lord of the Rings saga boxes, so it's hard to imagine that they would make many changes with the Lord of the Rings saga boxes. So as a new player, that means that I think you're pretty safe to buy the Lord of the Rings Saga boxes now if you want to and you don't have to wait for the repackaging. I, I highly doubt that there would be new content if they re-release those. So another interesting finding. Another thing I found is that there are some truly amazing staple cards included in these starter decks. Uh, things that solve some of, those, some of those basic problems that were lacking in the core set you'll find in these starter decks. Like there's not that much card draw in the core set. It's all restricted to the lore sphere primarily. These starter decks have a lot of card draw options in all of the different spheres. There's a tactics card draw and foe hammer. Uh, there's ancient Mathem from the spirit sphere, um, King under the mountain, and we are not idle from the leadership. So, uh, and Daron's runes in, in, in lore. So you get some of the best card draw effects in these starter decks. So you don't have to go hunting for those to get some basic uh, deck building tools. Uh, things like resource acceleration, uh, resource smoothing, to smooth out your resources across different spheres, to cost allies, weapons, defensive cards. There's a lot of basic staples in these starter decks that will get any new player off their feet very well. Um, and by my count, I saw about two thirds of the cards on average in each of these decks that are useful in a wide variety of decks. Two thirds that I would say are kind of general use cards. About one third of the cards in each of these decks, I would call trait specific cards, ones that I wouldn't really use outside of the dwarf deck or the Rohan deck. Either that or maybe they're just very niche cards that I would not use very often. So that was about one third of each pack, but that was actually less than I expected. I thought that there would be more uh, restrictive cards that were trait specific, but there's a lot of great general use cards in all of these starter packs. So who are these starter decks for exactly? I think that primarily these decks are for people that don't plan to buy the complete collection. Okay, there's 135 expansions and counting available for this game right now. So if you plan to buy everything, all of the cards in these decks are duplicates. So you're not going to need something like this, except for another reason I'll explain later. But if you don't plan to buy everything and you're just looking for some good decks to get started with, some staple cards you can build decks with, and then you plan to buy all the repackaged cycles that they're going to release, I think these starter decks are an excellent way to start. And they're gonna help because the Angmar Awakened cycle is pretty tough. So I think you're gonna need some good decks to get started going on those. So I think this is a great product to complement a, co a collection that's going to be incomplete in the end. Uh, because this fills in all the gaps for the cycles that you may not buy, uh, getting you sort of the best of for the other cycles that won't get repackaged. I also think these starter decks could be great for people who think the game is too difficult. Okay, I have played these decks quite a bit now in the core set and in the Dark of Mirk Mirkwood scenarios and some others, and they're not crazy power decks. They're not gonna beat every quest, but they are much better than what you'll get in the starter decks in the core set. And so they do make the game easier in that sense. So if you're finding the game too challenging, I think this is a great way to just get something going that you're gonna have a good time with, but they're thematic and they're fun and they're cohesive and they can help new players who struggle with deck building. And that's the other aspect here is if you don't like deck building, if you're not talented at it, you don't enjoy the aspect of customizing a deck to get an idea working, this is an excellent way to start. Um, Fantasy Flight's other LCG, the Marvel Champions, kind of takes this route where you get 
just a hero deck in a box. And so there is some deck building in Marvel Champions. There's a lot more in Lord of the Rings, so it can be more intimidating for newer players. This is an excellent way to get a deck going, and it gives you extra cards so you can customize it and get a flavor for the deck building the game really has to offer. And lastly, I think these starter decks can be great for veteran players who have larger collections who want a deck to give to a friend. Hand them a deck and they're good to go. You don't have to build your friend a deck ahead of time. I uh, just say, pick your favorite faction. I like Rohan. Okay, here's your Rohan deck. It's easy. It's quick. Uh, that can be great for veteran players. Or let's say you want a couple extra copies of some staple cards like Daron's Runes. Um, get the Elves deck and you can get a few extra copies of cards like that. It's a little expensive for that purpose, but again, for, um, for anyone that wants to introduce the game to new players, I think this is an excellent way to go. All right, so what's my final buying recommendation? I would say if you're only going to get one deck and you want the best cards concentrated, the most staple cards you can use in other decks, maybe the most fun deck to play, I think the Elves of Lorien takes the crown on all of that. Uh, by my count, there are the most sort of general use staple cards in this deck, uh, the, some of the strongest cards as well, Elrond and Vilia in particular, but also just the built-in elf starter deck I think is the most fun and varied to play. Um, it's not the simplest deck to play, but it's also not the most complex. Uh, so it sits right there in the middle of the sweet spot. I would say if you're only gonna get one of these and you're looking for the most fun, best cards to use, get the elves. If you're looking to get two decks that work well together, I would recommend getting the Gondor and Rohan decks. There's some really fun synergies that these two decks can kind of fill each other's weaknesses and complement each other in a two-player game. I had a lot of fun playing these together. So if you're looking for two decks that work well together, these are great to go with. Now the easiest deck to introduce new players to, I would say, is the Dwarf deck. It's the easiest to pilot, it's not complicated, you're just trying to get as many Dwarves out as you can. Um, as a fun alternative though, if you wanna really give this deck a good boost with another small investment, if you get the, uh, the Road Darkens Lord of the Rings Saga expansion, you get Gandalf Hero. And the Gandalf Hero with the Dwarf deck is a sight to behold. Uh, it's a much more complicated deck to pilot, um, but it's a lot of fun because Gandalf lets you peek always at the top card of your deck. So when you're doing the delving mechanic to discard cards, you get to see what you're discarding ahead of time. So it's an excellent combo just by having hero Gandalf in this deck uh, with all the delving mechanics and the mining mechanics, it can be a lot of fun that way. Now check out these other Lord of the Rings videos I've got linked here on the screen. I've got a how to play tutorial coming as well as a few others. Uh, you've been watching The Game Locker. That's one word, The Game Locker. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, please post them down below. If you've made it this far, thanks for watching. Godspeed.